Well, thanks for having me here. Um, Luxury Institute has been around for 18, 19 years now. Uh, we still conduct probably more research on the affluent than anybody on the planet. We go very upscale now. We're doing research. Uh, you know, we did research for NASA on space exploration. So we do that kind of research. We do a lot of uh, sales associate training and we help brands to build out their training programs using mostly primarily emotional intelligence elements and concepts and techniques. Uh, but, uh, and we still have a consulting firm, but the thing that I'm most excited about is the data. You know, Mickey, that I'm a, an avid investor and I believe in personal data rights. And uh, so that's one of my purposes in life. One of my goals in life is to empower people to take control of their personal data and license it to brands for fair rewards. So that's uh, the main area where we invest right now with my colleague, Katie. And we also just created a new analytics company called Affluent Analytics Lab to do the heavy lifting on that type of massive data from Google, Facebook that consumers are downloading. So that's the essence of what we're doing. We've had to reinvent the luxury institute probably 10 times over the last 20 years. And so now we're in data analytics big time, but who knows what we'll be in in five years. So uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Milton. This is going to be uh, almost like a rapid fire session, but Milton and I are basically going to analyze seven, uh, I think it's seven, right? Seven yep, sectors. Seven categories, yeah. Categories in luxury and where Milton sees these categories going in 2022. Milton, let's start talking about the one that gets the most attention, fashion and leather goods. Where do you see fashion leather goods going in 2022? Okay, first of all, we see it up strongly. And let me delineate a few elements of how we size that up. We still see that winners, the top brands, are taking the most. And there's still a long tail of what we call mediocrity or average performance. So just keep that in mind as we look at the overall category growth. Consumers are, in terms of apparel, they're doing their wardrobes for that mixed new reality of less commuting, but also more Zoom. I think people are wanting to refresh their um, apparel. So that's pretty big. Uh, pricing power is limited because they, we've taken a lot of price increases in luxury. And that's one of the reasons the inflation is so high, but it has its limits. So I think in 2022, we may have limited pricing power. <clears throat> people are consuming less sustainability, but better quality. So that drives up the value of the category. And in, uh, the, the bottom line on that is that leather goods and substitutes, because we're going to get some substitutes for leather, uh, remain strong since they are, they are the statement piece of everyone, right? They are continuing to, whenever uh, someone has a fashion statement to make, they want to show off, they want to, the, the leather goods are the, for men, their wallets, for women, their handbags are still the item. Uh, and I think we'll continue for a long time. So we expect the category to grow strongly. Uh, online growth will continue, but I always like to, to caveat that by saying that returns are always a challenge in apparel and accessories. So the economics, the revenue may be high, but sometimes the profit doesn't follow entirely. So yes, so that, solid you know, growth. And what, what what people often forget in and this is not just luxury, but the returns is cumbersome. In, in I, I remember reading somewhere that's 40% in fashion. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. So, and um, so, yes, so revenues up strongly, profitability by brand, and of course, the top brands, the biggest brands, the Chanel's, the Hermes's, the Gucci's, the Dior's, the Saint Laurent's, they reap most of the profitability. So, Milton, if we had to, uh, you know, say, all right, What's the dominant trend you expect in fashion leather goods this year? Let's talk about, you know, let's start with the consumer. Are they going to buy more online or are they going to buy more in store? I think they're going to buy more online for sure, just as we just heard in automotive. But the stores are still relevant. Stores sometimes are where we go and learn about the product and we go back and buy online later. But I think that uh, there's no question with COVID, with uh, the digitalization of everything, we're going to buy sight unseen a lot more than we used to because we trust those brands. So I think online will grow. What about merchandise? What, what's the number one merchandise trend you expect to see? Well, I think that the classics still prevail. I think that we look at handbags now and leather goods as investment pieces. So the brands, the classics within the brands are still the products that you see, whether it's Louis Vuitton, whether it's Gucci, whether it's uh, Chanel, Hermes. 
the classic product are still the most valuable in the resale market. So you may not ever want to sell it, but you're buying it as an investment piece. So I think that that will always prevail. And then of course they'll have their new, the new lines uh, come in and out. But I think the classics are what drive those brands right now and they always will. Brands, winners. Well, I think it's always the Chanel, the Hermes, the uh, Dior, the uh, Gucci, Saint Laurent. I mean, there's other, in, in leather goods, there's other brands, but those massive brands continue to still be the, the brands, uh, you know, like in Bulgari has handbags. So jewelry brands kind of bleed into that. But I still think the top brands will get most of the merchandise because Gen Z's and millennials are smart. They, they understand investment value. And I think that's where uh, you see the growth uh, overall. You know, you can have a lot of, you know, you know, one-time offerings, but the classics are still the ones. When I went into Louis Vuitton, that's what they're selling, the classics, right? especially for young people. And that's what I, I don't see a lot of uh, variance to that over the long term in leather goods. So basically what you're saying is that if you're a luxury brand, make sure that you embed yourself in your target customer's mind as an investment. The brand that if they're buying you, it's an investment. And it's not just, you know, exactly. ad, you know. I mean, you're seeing that in, and we'll see other categories, we'll talk about them, but the investment pieces, and therefore very often the classics of a brand, the quilted Chanel bags, uh, those products have tremendous um, uh, investment value and long-term value, and, and, and people are seeing them as, in, as investments these days. Great, thank you. Milton, well, let's go on to our next category. I know we alluded to it uh, in the previous session with Tyson Germany, automotive. What do you expect to see in automotive this year? I think it'll be up solidly. I think there are several factors. Uh, chip shortages are going to constrain supply, but what the dealers keep doing is raising the prices, so they offset the lower volumes. Uh, people are going to be commuting more by car. It's interesting that New York has traffic jams because people are driving more and not using the trains or the buses, et cetera, or, or even walking. So you see a lot more commuting by car and a, a lot more local vacations, and that's going to drive purchase. People are upgrading, as we heard, into luxury, luxury uh, variants of, of the cars and into luxury brands. There's a very strong luxury pre-owned market, and that continues. In fact, I've, I've been looking for a car for my son, and the BMW dealers have told me that they have far more previously owned cars than new cars, and the new cars just go like that. So I think that will be a market. And, and it was touched upon that electric cars will drive new demand. Uh, I think we're still waiting for more places to plug our cars. We're, we're, we're waiting for batteries that give us more mileage. But I think that Tesla has lots of chips and lots of supply. They didn't do what the other dealers do, which uh, other brands did, which was cut back dramatically. And then they were left with, uh, with the low inventory when, when the market turned. So I think Tesla will benefit a lot from the electric car movement. Um, and, and you're seeing that they're moving up in the ranks as we see. So up solidly, but a lot of it may be dollars as opposed to only volume. And uh, in terms of you know, types of cars, I know that, again, previous session we mentioned SUVs. I guess that's where the market's heading, right? Well, it is heading that way, but I'll tell you a category that is on fire right now is hypercars. Cars that are two million dollars, et cetera. And so we're seeing that with the very wealthy. And I think it was I think it was Tyson, I think he touched upon it. That market is on fire, it's growing. And I think that we'll expect to see that consume that the brands will offer consumers a lot more exclusive products at the top. And I think that's a whole category that's in the making, along with the hypercars. You're never going to drive a hypercar in the street, but you're going to own it and you're going to take care of it and you're going to take it on the track and you're going to have it as a, a, as a, a piece, almost like a you know, bragging rights piece. Uh, but that, I think that category is going to thrive. So it's like a Bugatti Veyron and all those cars. You know? Exactly. And there's a lot of competitors now and there's a lot of demand and there's tons of money out there. So we're seeing that as growth. And yeah, SUVs. Uh, will continue, but I, I, I do see a comeback in sedans. I do. Uh, I, I think the market uh, for sedans will continue. I see a lot more younger people 
telling me that they like sedans more than they like SUVs. So let's see what happens. But, you know, and I'm making a huge prediction, but I think it'll be a tempered, balanced market. And so, I mean, uh, do you see that uh, this trend uniform across the world or is North America different from Latin America or Europe or Asia Pacific or I Africa? Think, I think the wealthy tend to follow each other and they tend to follow America, let's be candid, and, and Europe. Uh, so I think that whatever trends we see in the affluent and the wealthy in automotive in America and Europe, we're going to see, uh, you know, pervade the entire world. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's move on to wines and spirits, right? I mean, this is, I mean, we were locked up for this past two and a half years. I mean, two years almost. Right. And, um, you know, and obviously we couldn't celebrate as much outside, but the industry didn't do badly either. No, um, I think one of the reasons is that this is an innovative category. So we're starting to see wine in a can, pre-mixes, seltzers. They don't all thrive, but we get a lot of experimentation and young people love to experiment. And so we see that as part of the growth. Obviously, you've mentioned it, the, home, the uh, increase in home consumption is huge. And, and, I, and I would even uh, clarify by saying isolation and stress relief, end of the day ritual, dry wine and spirit consumption. And then you see that uh, consumers, especially Gen Zs and millennials, are going from quantity to quality and are becoming connoisseurs. So they're starting to spend maybe sometimes less or stretching sometimes, but they're spending connoisseur level. They're going for the $40, $50 bottle of wine or the very, uh, very high-end liqueur, even if it's infrequent, that's driving it. And again, bars and restaurants, I think as, as we're getting um, messages and signals that COVID now is not going to be as deadly or as you know as as uh, difficult as the other variants i think we're going to see restaurants after q1 we're going to see bars and restaurants continue to recover they're pretty full right now maybe not in new york but i can tell you in many other states they are and so i think as covid gets less deadly we're going to see bars and restaurants recover strongly after q1 and the final thing i would say about this category is it's always recession resilient and at the end, I'm going to share with you some risks that I see in the economy. But should we ever have one, I think this is the category that is most resilient to any downturn should the Fed go too far. So if you had to name winners in this, I mean, I know that LVMH controls most of the big, you know, champagne houses and all that. But, you know, you also have Bernard Ricard and you have... Absolutely. Uh, Constellation oh. Brands, It's and it's not only wine, Constellation owns Corona and Modelo. They're going yeah. to do very well. So I think it's across the board. And they will compete for the dollars with one another. But the, the market growth helps everyone. Moet Hennessy has the classics, Pernod Ricard, right? So when you look at that. But also, I see a lot of boutique wineries doing very well because they're producing some very, very fine products. And these days, you can gain the awareness, even if, if it's a long tail. I mean, you know that wine is multi-brand and you know, uh, they really own portfolios when they own these products, uh, Moet Hennessy and Constellation and others. I see the high end, of course, doing better. Um, and look, you can go to Costco and, and when you buy wine at Costco these days, it's all the prisoner, you know, uh, really top, top, top wines. It's not Duckhorn. It's not the low end anymore. And so I think that you're going to see the price, the price points go up higher in consumption. Uh, as people become more connoisseurs, especially the young people. It's funny you mentioned Costco. I don't know most people if they're aware that Costco is the number one seller of wines in America. It's the number one seller. And so, I would uh, argue, you know, yeah, I mean, you're seeing uh, 200 $300 bottles of wine in there, okay? This is serious. Yeah. And this is, you know, as, as, they, as they say, it's the Bentleys, the Aston Martin uh, SUVs that are lining up to shop there. This is not, uh, this is not low end whatsoever. People want a good deal. <laughs> well, that's one way of getting rich, right? You save more money. Um, watches and jewelry. I mean, this category took a slight hit the last couple of years. But, uh, jewelry was performed better than watches, but what's your take for 2022? I see it up strongly, and, and there are several reasons why. First of all, the growth in iconic branded pieces, again, as investment items, continues. Second, I see that I see it in my colleagues in Palm Beach and in New York. Where to find watch for men and women, or a piece of jewelry 
is again a defining statement. I said that, of course, the letter is, is a, a statement maker, but so is today, again, the watch and the jewelry. Uh, and remember that these products are imbued with emotionally powerful stories, they're special occasion pieces, and they're even more popular, and they became even more popular when we couldn't travel, where were we gonna put our money? Well, jewelry, is, uh, jewelry and watches are natural for us to make ourselves feel special, better, et cetera even to show off a little on Zoom with my big watch. That's what people tend to do. That quality over quantity trend continues because again of the investment aspects. Uh, local buying remains strong, even though we have low tourism, you know, jewelry and watches used to be, you know, a very high tourism kind of, uh, tourism drove a lot of that, but it's like wines and spirits, but they haven't suffered that much because of local consumption. I think Apple, which was what, the brand that took away a lot of the volume from the Swiss uh, will continue to innovate and grow the category and drive growth. And I'll give you an example. The more functionality, health and wellness functionality that an Apple Watch carries, the more you're gonna get consumption of the Apple Watch. And they're gonna do a lot more deals. Of course, they did a nice deal with their mess. You're gonna see them cooperate with other brands, very much like what Gucci did, right? Just open it up to collaboration. So you're going to get bands from famous brands and, you know, you're going to get a whole constellation around the iWatch. And I think you're going to see a lot of growth there. And I think you're going to see price points go up because I think you're going to see much better materials, much fight, much more uh, bejeweled materials. I think the innovation is there uh, for the taking and they haven't taken advantage of that yet, but I think they will collaborating with a Cartier, with a Bulgari, with a Tiffany. That opportunity is still waiting out there, uh, or with the other, like the Pateks and the Vacherons. There's no reason why they shouldn't be collaboration, unless brands are kind of stayed and, and you know, close-minded. But I think Apple is going to drive a lot of that, not just through functionality, but through collaborations. And of course, we're seeing, as as was described by Carl, some more online purchasing of very expensive pieces, again from trusted brands. Right? If you trust the brand, you may not have to go to the store as often. Oh, well, you know, jewelry and watches are still, I want to try it on. I want to see how it looks. But once I've done that, or once I know the brand well, buying online will continue to uh, become more pervasive. So, um, Milton, you know, again, with Apple Watch, right? I mean, I'm sure people are aware of this, but it's the number one watchmaker in the world. It overtook Rolex uh, three years ago or so. Yes. And, uh, you know. But they're still so cheap, right? They need to up their, they need to become far more luxurious. Well, I just, I forgot the numbers, the, you know, when they released the Apple numbers a few days ago. It's shocking to see the the watch. I mean, I don't know if they break it up, but the non, I mean, that's a bigger category now than laptops yeah, or Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an accessory. So, Why not, right? It's an accessory and it's open to many, many more millions of people. And the more technology and the more functionality you put into that watch, and it's going through the roof. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal about that recently. Uh, you know, heart rate. I mean, you're going to have so many uh, beyond heart rate, but all of the health and wellness metrics uh, are going to be part of that. I, of course, I worry about privacy and who owns the data, which is a consumer, but let's not go that there. Let's just say that the functionality of your watch and your phone are going to go through the roof. We haven't seen anything yet, and so that will drive the demand. I'm very surprised that luxury brands, especially watchmakers, haven't gone gotten onto the wellness trend because that to me is where, you know, I mean, yes, you have collector's pieces and you have all these, you know, constellations and all that, movements and all that. But the fact is that, you know, uh, I know that, you know, at that level, you have a watch that's utilitarian and a watch that's, you know, you're collecting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, another thing for us to keep in mind is the new Tiffany. Right. I mean, Tiffany is, you know, the, the flagship store here is in New York is undergoing renovation. I think it should be done end of this year or 2023. I don't know. But uh, yes. uh, Mr. Arno's son, Alexander, is now in charge of their marketing and all that. Mm -hmm. So they're going head to head with Cartier uh, and they've taken that love positioning and all that. So do you see Tiffany? radically changing the strategy. What, are the, what do you expect LVMH to do with Tiffany in 2022? I'll tell you a funny story. So I was interviewed uh, by the Wall Street Journal 
uh, about Tiffany and their strategy. And when I saw the article, I was happy I wasn't quoted because they really tried to trash Tiffany. And I oh had God. told them exactly the opposite. And this okay. is, these, that, let me see if I remember everything I told them. Number one, I think their marketing is genial with Jay-Z and Beyonce, right? Because they are icons, but they open it up to the whole world. They are inclusive icons. Number two, they're going to go up market and they're gonna do what they did with Bulgari. They're gonna make it even more luxurious. And a little bit like Harrods, they're probably gonna eliminate, you know how Harrods eliminated the teddy bears and the toys and all the tourists from the first floor, but then they went mega up market and have done a phenomenal job. I do expect them to do that at Tiffany. I don't think Tiffany will be as much of a, mass, of, of, let's call it a, an affluent mass brand unless people stretch. So I think they're going to elevate the product and the value of the of, of each product so that they're going to go much higher in, in terms of luxury. I believe they will innovate on product and I believe they will have a great watch. And let's see how that goes because, you know, uh, Tiffany tried with Swatch and that didn't work. Then it was they lawsuits. Just recently, the new collaboration with Patek Philippe. I think, yeah, and, and it was a beautiful collaboration. It, it leveraged the elements of both brands, but I think on a more volumetric scale, they're gonna go and build a, a great watch. I think great. they're gonna go online far more. I think they're gonna open a lot more stores, and I think they're gonna transform this brand, which was tired and you know uh, a little more massified into another iconic multi-billion dollar brand that's very profitable. So and that's gonna... exactly what I told the Wall Street Journal, but they, they went with the, oh, we don't like what they did here. Oh, the culture isn't. No, the culture of Tiffany needed a shakeup and it got it. It got it from the masters, okay? And it needed it. God bless them. It, it's an American brand, but they needed it and they got it. And thank God, because the luxury industry will be better off for it. And so Alexander Arnaud, was placed at Remova when LVMH bought that German brand and he transformed mm -hmm. that uh, German brand, luggage brand. And, you know, now of course prices are double and all that, but he changed the positioning and, you know, yes. he's here at Tiffany to do the same. All right. So we are done with watches. I, and I think he'll do a great job. I think he'll do a great job. Excellent. Uh, real estate. I mean, you know, obviously given what, I mean, we've discussed so much about real estate, right? I mean, Mart, I mean, Milton, you're seeing people because of the pandemic, they have disposable income, right? And the stock market's performed well, but mortgage rates were at a historic low. And of course, at that level, people just pay cash. They buy homes. Mm -hmm. So you saw exactly. this whole yeah. right to safety. And, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, Chris uh, mentioned in the previous session that, you know, a flight in America from high tax, colder states, to low tax, warmer states. I think uh, I can count you as one of those <laughs> reps. <laughs> yes, me and my entire team, Katie, whoever we could get down here. <laughs> I'm in New York today, actually, but yes. And believe so what, me, the savings are huge. Yeah, so I mean, I, I see that, you know, a lot of uh, affluent consumers, they've, you know, taken the pandemic to reassess their quality of life. And, you know, a hybrid working lifestyle has enabled them to do that. I mean, they're very lucky they can do that because not everybody can be divorced from their place of work, right? If you're in retail, you have to be physically present. If you're in manufacturing, you have to be physically present. So you're going to see a continued pressure on housing stock, not just in the United States, but across the world, simply because there's so much more demand. There's so much cash. I mean, uh, you know, we've not been able to travel as much. so. The stock market's gone up, our net worth has gone up, and at the same time, you want a better quality of life. So, I mean, are you? is there anything else you're noticing? Will this have a domino effect on anything else? Well, I think that people will have multiple homes going forward because I think that once you get down to Florida, you realize that, hey, you know what? I miss the Northeast. I miss the culture. I miss the network. So let's have two homes. And I see a lot of people saying that to me. I spoke to a couple the other day at the Royal Plum Yacht Club, and they were, they were saying, you know what? We were from DC and we love Boca, but we're going to go and buy a home back in, uh, I forget what they said, in near Bethesda. So I think you're going to see that the demand obviously is pent up. The supply is, you know better than I do because you're an expert in this, is really tight. So let's see what happens. Uh, but I think that 
housing is the only category where if a downturn occurs, and by the way, the Fed is going to raise the rates four times this year. Oh, four. Oh. four times, I say now, right? Starting in March. Um, let's see how they do it. Um, I mean, the only thing I can tell you is that you know, I had five scenarios uh, of um, macroeconomic potential challenges. To me, the number one is as the Federal Reserve shifts the focus, right, in monetary policy, and they raise interest rates and stop doing the bond work, stocks that are, are at near bubble highs. Real estate is very, very high um, in pricing, and cryptocurrencies have been going through the roof. So major asset values, I think, may stumble or they can tumble. And I think that's the risk that I see in 2022. We're flush with money. There's, you know, we're all happy. But I think you need, as a luxury brand, you need to have plan B in case the Fed screws it up. Because they think they're going to do it very surgically. But life is not that exact. So that's my only concern. And it obviously real estate is uh, one concern, except it's mitigated by the fact that there's such low supply out there. And I think that's what saves real estate. I'm not sure it saves stocks. And I'm definitely sure it doesn't save cryptocurrency. But I think real estate is the most resilient one of, of those major assets. And plus the, the, the homes that were bought, they were not bought on mortgages. They bought all cash. So exactly. they're not... This round, they're not heavily leveraged compared to the previous cycles. And compared um, to stocks and crypto, yes, exactly right. Yeah. So let's come to let's come to retail. Um, you know, you heard some of our previous panels talk about e-commerce, mm -hmm. uh, stores, and all that. What is the future of retail? How will retail look in 2022? Well, I think it'll be a lot more online for sure, uh, and I think we know that. Um, there's a consumer preference to buy online and that favors the online players. But I would also remind us that the profits in online are elusive. There's a tremendous amount of overhead. Nobody will accept shipping, being charged for shipping. And they will definitely do returns, as you say, sometimes at 30, 40% rates. And at least for now, that has not been solved, right? So I think that that's the risk of that the far fetches of the world, the wide naps of the world, continue to grow the my Teresa's, but show me the profits, show me the profit margins. That's all I want to see. Show me the profits. And so I always think that that growth, they're not Amazon. Okay. They don't have a WS and they don't have uh, all the elements that Amazon, they don't even have the data that Amazon has. So I think that's where, you know, if you try to say, Oh, well, but look what Amazon did. I don't think that's going to work for online luxury retailers. So that's the only concern I have. They don't get growth but I don't think they will get as much as the uh, profitability as they think. We also know that the best brands are going direct to consumer and they will continue to do that, right? So 80%, 90% of their volume, they want to build a relationship with the consumer, particularly because they want the relationship and the first party data. And, I, and, and, and the online platforms don't give them that. So I think that will continue. Um, I, I also will tell you that I think that one of the challenges that the Neiman Marcuses and Sachs of the world have, and they might disagree with me, is poor clienteling. First of all, they're challenged by labor issues, right? They can't get people to work. They have to quarantine. A lot of people don't want to do those jobs as much anymore. They're trading to other jobs. But the training and development of people and the effort to do real relationship building I know that Vincent Yang was talking about that. You can do it online. But I think those two are part of the Achilles heels of the luxury retailers, both online and offline. Now, I, I think overall, the industry will have higher volumes in 2022. But again, I would say that between overheads, labor shortages, high labor costs, mediocre service, that challenges profitability long term. So let's stay tuned. You see Saks breaking up their online and their store. I think that's a mistake. I think anybody who thinks that they can do that, except for maybe hedge funds that want to milk those companies. Uh, I think that keeping that across the channel, uh, that, that gives you synergy. It's a word that people don't like to use, but it gives you elements of synergy where you can really help consumers and build a one, a one person relationship across channels. And I think that opportunity may be lost if they split up the brands uh, the way, uh, split up the channels within a brand uh, the way that others are talking about it. 
So I think that it, the industry will grow, but maybe not as profitably as all the other industries that we talked about. And, and, and you know, the thing is that you're, you're so right about the monobrand stores because I think they're the biggest threat to the department store model. And, you know, already the department store model was shaky prior to the pandemic. And you right. saw what happened in Neiman Marcus, not, not because the model failed, but because private equity brought it, bought it, and then milked it for all its worth, started Barnes. and then yeah. Yeah, bond. The same thing happened there. But, you know, when you look at, I mean, you know that e-commerce is going to be big for now. At the end of the day, won't these brands themselves face the same issues that retailers are facing, the same returns, high overheads, you know, all that? I mean, won't that hit their profit margins as they chase direct-to-consumer? Yes, for the mediocre brands. For the long tail of luxury, that is a risk. For the top brands that can price very robustly that have great social media presence, that are really have very iconic and unique product. I think that the growth will continue and we see their margins, right? The Hermes margins, the Chanel margins, the Gucci margins. Those are high, high margins. The retailers can't equal that. Um, they, they just can't compete with that. But I think that the reality is that consumers do want multi-purpose, multi-brand stores. They just don't need them as much as they used to because you can, you know, when you shop online, you can, pick and choose uh, very easily. And so I'm not sure that, and of course the platforms now, as they say, every, every media company wants to be an e-commerce company and every e-commerce company wants to be a media company, as you heard from Vincent and from uh, the, the executive from Pinterest. So I think that we're gonna see this uh, confluence uh, of media and platform growing dramatically. And that may hurt uh, besides the fact that of course, uh, uh, monoline brands are going to do their own videos and their own live streaming on their own websites. I think that's what's going to save them. And yeah, they'll reduce the store count if needed. They'll have smaller stores. You know, Tiffany has a store, I think down in Soho or um, close yes, to the so. village. So, so, so I think that we, then we'll find ways that the brands that are healthy will find ways to adapt to whatever consumers want. You want a smaller city? We'll put a store in a smaller city. You want smaller stores? Fine. Uh, will eliminate stores in particular places. I think that adaptability is going to be, is going to keep them in good stead. But I think there's a whole line of, bra of brands out there that, that are luxury, that are a boring product, that are not technologically savvy, that are not social media savvy, that are going to probably lose and, and they may disappear. And we'll see new brands. And you know, uh, we don't, we didn't talk much about this, but it's also the product skews, the, the offering itself, you know, how, you know, how many categories, you know, like when you talk about Gen Z and millennials, will they be interested in China, even at a life stage point? I mean, I look at Gen Xers, my generation. I mean, my friends don't even want to take out the China when people are around because they don't want to be bothered with putting it, you know, they've got to wash with their hands, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. 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 There are a lot of categories that will come obsolete. There's no question about it. Which categories do you think? Uh, I mean, will this year be the start of some obsolescence? I mean, which categories do you think? Well, I think they're, you know, and I'm looking at services as well as goods. You know, it used to be that you hired the alarm company to do your home security. I don't need that anymore. You know, that's, that's technology has overtaken that. Um, I think that there are a lot of appliances that, that are going to have to automate and be technologically advanced or they're going to be obsolete. You know, irons and things like that, they're just like useless products or products that are, have not... Uh, automated and become technologically advanced. And also there's a convergence of products. So we just talked about um, Apple and how much value they add more and more and more in terms of helping you manage your entire life, right? Uh, so I think that what we're gonna see is that there's a lot of categories that used to be mono categories and are just gonna converge the way that, you know, the way that this now has so many apps, right? It used to be a phone and now it is half your life. So I think we're going to see that. And I think we're going to see a lot more luxury versions of this. You know, there were phones that tried to do it with Bejeweled, but they had no tech. You have to have the tech. But once you have the tech, like the Apple Watch, then you can really start riffing. And they haven't even started to do that yet. You see it in automotive, of course, right? You see that um, Aston Martin has a gorgeous SUV. And you can see, as I said, the hypercars and 
you know, there's even some that are powered by batteries, right? So you're going to see tremendous innovation in products, but they're going to knock out a lot of other products that are become useless as you converge a lot of technology into one product, into one offering. Um, I just see a tremendous amount of innovation. The more that consumers own their data, I'll put in a plug for that, the more you control your data, the more the company is going to be able to innovate in medicine, in finance, and in, in luxury consumption. Then we're going to get real personalization. And then what about the final category, travel and hospitality? I mean, they took this biggest hit out of all luxury sectors. And you're seeing, again, you know, these closures, you know, up and down the country and, you know, I mean, all these regulations. While we were talking, the Supreme Court, I got an alert from the Wall Street Journal, the Supreme Court blocked Biden's COVID-19 vaccine rules for large private employers, but allowed them for the healthcare industry. Um, well, so, I you think, know, you know, you would expect that, but so let's talk about travel and COVID and all the things. I think it's definitely the worst hit category by the pandemic, and it's still experiencing that long distance traveler fear. I think a lot of people don't want to, someone told me yesterday that an executive that people don't want to go to Tahiti because they don't want to get stuck there with COVID or medical problems. So they're going to go local in their own countries, but there's also labor shortages that dampen capacity utilization. So I may have a hotel, but if I don't have enough staff, I need to limit it to 40% capacity, 50% capacity. So that's a big constraint. The airlines have major supply issues, as we know, but one of the reasons is a self-inflicted wound that they laid everybody off during COVID, and then a lot of people didn't want to come back. And of course, now they're getting sick and you have the quarantine, et cetera. So there's a lot of self-inflicted wounds, but they're also, all of these industries are going to have to raise their labor, uh, the, the payments that they make to their labor or they're not gonna exist. So that's gonna be a problem. I think the, 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 the good news is that by Q2 or Q3, if what we see happen, happen in South Africa, happens in the US and other parts of the world, that this, this strain of COVID is much more quick to collapse. Let's see what happened next. But um, I think that we're gonna see a lot more travel in Q2, Q3, and maybe open up overseas. So I think, I think that it's going to bode well in the second half. But the first half, I think, is going to be very tough. The other thing, though, I would tell you, I see a lot of new luxury properties and a lot of new renovations. And so I think there's going to be a lot more choices out there for consumers. That's good for them. It's not as good for the luxury hotel brands because they're opening up a lot of properties. Uh, and somebody has to consume those. So I, I, I see the, the uh, luxury travel industry up steadily, but I don't see you know, great growth uh, because it's going to be competitive. And I think rep parts are going to stay relatively mild throughout the year. And, you know, another trend we're seeing is um, co-branded residences, right? So they're allying themselves with luxury brands, uh, the hotels like Baccarat or, you know, like Aston Martin, luxury brand and all that. So we're Armani seeing- has done it. Yeah, sure. Bulgari has hotels, but, but right. they all will go to, uh, they'll, they'll all do residential for sure. Yeah. So, 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 you know, I mean, even cruises, I mean, you know, they, they start their cruise and then, you know, everyone catches COVID and then they're docked and again, they can't uh, go out there. So I say, I guess this is the one sector that still uh, compared to all the sectors we discussed, this is kind of one where there's the most weakness. Right. The most challenged and will remain. So I don't think until 2024, are we going to see the robust travel breakout that we would like to see? I know that sounds a little pessimistic, but uh, I think it's also realistic. So Milton, we've come to the end. Uh, I would love for you to very quickly give us a take uh, up, down, or flat for 2022 luxury. I think up mildly, because I think uh, the risk is that if we have the 80% of the consumers who are stretching to buy 30% of the sales, they always decide whether we are going to have a great year, a good year, or a bad year. I think there's a risk out there that unemployment, that the Fed kicks in too high on interest rates. Unemployment, even though right now, yeah, we, we have too many jobs and not enough people to fill them, unemployment starts to kick in, then that 30% of consumers are going to withdraw. Milton, what is the biggest threat to lux the luxury business in 2022? I think there are two. One is the Fed, 
screwing up their easing, their monetary easing. Uh, they're not pumping money into the economy any, anymore, and investors are very sensitive to that. Interest rates are very sensitive to that. There's high inflation right now. If they break the back of inflation, there's only one way to do it. It's called unemployment, okay? And that's historic. The second one that I'm concerned about, the luxury industry, is that China may, be, uh, may become a place where they promote less wealth and therefore less consumption, but that that is replaced more by local luxury brands, which are up and coming. And so I see those two risks as the potential risk for the luxury industry. Um, and I, there are more. You know, we could have a cyber attack, blah, blah, blah. You know, you could have Taiwan, Korea, uh, Ukraine issues. But those two, the Fed's uh, actions and the Chinese government's actions versus wealth and to promote local luxury consumption might be the two challenges that I would keep an eye on in 2022. And what if you had to pinpoint two opportunities that our audience should take advantage of for 2022? as a luxury marketer? I think that India is an underdeveloped market. I think that India has a lot more potential than brands have cultivated. Uh, and I think, and, and other parts of Asia, by the way, not just India. But I also think that, um, and, I, and you know me, I'm a data guy, that the ability to go and get data from your consumer legally, as opposed to doing what we're doing now, coercing and getting third-party data, is the way to build long-term relationships that are loyal and where you can really start to personalize and therefore get more value from the customer because they value personalization. Right now, we don't have a lot of personalization. We have segmentation, but we don't have real personalization. Uh, and I think those are the two big opportunities. 